what that prayer looks like. It's still a very Christian way of centering the world. Uh, Jay and I were talking last night about we had done an uh, interfaith service for creating change a couple of years ago, uh, and it was all virtual. And it was like it was a beautiful interfaith service that we had like 17 spiritual practices represented, but it was still a Christian service. You started with a call to prayer. You had a unity light. You had a Christian. God blesses this space, whatever, whatever. You had a hymn, you had a homily, you had a, and then you had like these sprinkling of other traditions in between. So I was like, the table is still a Christian table, but you're trying to feel good about it because you've expanded the table, but the expanding does not decenter the table. There, as a vegetarian, I'm like, it's still just meat on the table. And you expect like, well, you have a seat at the table, but if I can't eat it, then it is not actually doing the work of what you're telling me you're doing, but it makes you feel good about yourself. It's a self-centered experience that is not actually challenging Right? And so the goal of our work is to heal in the way that is right for the person that we are supporting and not in the way that we want to do the work. And so this, again, the, if we're able to see that healing and soothing in the forms of interfaith work and interfaith healing requires to say, what is healing for you? And am I able to ask you that question? What is soothing for you? And then what can I tap into in my own spiritual practice that says, okay, this is how I understand spirituality and healing. Does that work for you? Or what is your framework that allows you to understand that? And then how do we get that? What are the resources that I have in my access and resources and connection and worldview that can help connect you to the, our liberation community? Rather than saying, this is the form of healing I can provide you and do this or more. Right, because I think a lot of Christianity that I feel is that of like, this is what I have to offer you, take it or leave it, which often leaves a lot of us outside the door if we're even in the neighborhood. Or sit through a sermon before I give you. Right, 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 exactly. And so how does that shape the work that we do? And so... So your first question from us, Kasha, about why we need to be centered, because that response of, like, I have the answers and it resonates with you and you're on your way to the very elitist and very um, uh, religious leader focus. So I think that's one of the things that we need to be centered is that it's only men Right. Like, uh, um, rabbinical, rabbinity, sure. all these different, and, and because that's what interfaith dialogue was in this country for sure. so long. Sure. And so, in I, a very Judeo Christian framework. Judeo, yeah. 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 <laughs> and the Judeo Christian framework, instead, you're talking about where we now, as healers or social workers or caseworkers or citizens, also respond in that way as interfaith leaders. I mean, you're talking about decades to decenter that, that it's, it's not the person with all the degrees, and it's not the person at the front or whatever space that knows all that is best for the community in the space, and it has to be done in this way. And that everyone knows their own truth, and that that's enough, right? Uh, I think you and I have talked about, like, I've been thinking about going to divinity school, even though I don't want to go, and my thing is, I don't want to go through a Christian class again. I'm like, I've done enough Jesus, I've done enough Bible in my life, and I'm like, I'm good. Like, I understand Jesus because I live it every day. Yeah. And yet, in order to go to a program, and the only reason I feel it is because the only way I feel validated and the way I'm taught to be validated is I have this letter or this document from a Christian-centered space that tells me that I know what the fuck I'm talking about, even though that's not at all in the realm of how I want to exist. Right? And this, str this internal struggle of insecurity of, like, am I enough gets to because the only people that are allowed to have you know, professability are the people who have that microphone. And that then it's take again, it is this whiteness, white of like, I can tell you what's good for you because I, I know what is good for you, and then you will do it or else you'll be you know, you'll be whatever, uh, admonished, right? It, and which again like feels like a very puritanical time of slavery way of seeing the world and, and creating change which is why like our education is because that's also based on like it's based on control and not an actual reality and not an actual liberation uh so my friend bobby uh dr bobby who works in the chapel Hill, uh, and i came up with this complex uh, accomplice framework for a workshop that we did a couple of years ago and i really love it and i was like i thought you know as we're thinking about like what does it mean for christians to for folks in dominant spaces to deconstruct and decolonize. I think this is. I think this is the work, right? And so we have this acronym for our accomplice. Um, and I think one of the speakers today talked about I'm an accomplice, right? Uh, not just being an ally. An ally is still from a sense of power because you're not willing to give up anything. 
because you can still say, "Oh, I did this for you. You feel I feel good about myself." Again, it's a, it's a self. It's an opposite self pleasure. It's a self aggrandizing because I did this one thing, right? I I gave ten dollars to the goodwill, so I'm a good person, rather than I actually am working on fixing homelessness, poverty, food insecurity, all the other things that actually are changing because I'm also willing to live in that space. Um, and so I, for me, this works, and I'm not going to read all through all of it because y'all can read. Um, but I think the the first, it's it, there is it, there is a, a linear and a cyclical process to this that there is not. It is they do go. You know, you can start with one and go to A through E, but then you can also they change they they change order as you need them. And so this is not a the way. This is not the only path, but it's a path embedded into multiple paths, right? Then you can have both and in the same thing. Uh, and then acknowledging kind of what it means to exist in a Christian world where Christ, Jesus, etc., is every single part of our world from time to days to hours to celebrations to days off to, to clothing to sayings to prayers to Bibles and hotel rooms to everything that we exist within exists in that framework. And so I'm always having to recognize and realize like this world is not built for people that believe like me. And that I somehow have to always feel like I have to stake place and stake space to exist and feel like I'm valid enough to exist in that world. Um, down to the assumptions, right? Like, what is that? What are the actual things I'm, I don't even know that I know? And how is that harming me and the work that I'm trying to do? And where do I lead with that space? Um, the mindful breathing for me is about, can we just be in our bodies and recognize when we fuck up, when we do good, when we actually are able to say, I'm going to just sit in this breath. What does it mean for me to do this work? What does it mean for existing this work? And am I able to just own, Thich Nhat Hanh says, being in this moment, this is a wonderful moment. Regardless of what moment it is, being in this moment is a wonderful moment. Are you able to own that even in a moment of teaching? So I say, being in this moment, if I've just been called in or called out, this is a wonderful moment. That this is a gift from some divine experience to say, I'm learning, I'm engaging, I'm unraveling, I'm un decolonizing myself in this space and engaging in this work. And then I think the the cult, the last two that are really important for me is like the cultivating community. You have to have community people that are willing to challenge and engage with you in ways that allow for us to think differently. If all your friends are Christian, five minutes thinking. Uh, if all your friends are Christian and we somehow expect us to have interfaith dialogue, that's not going to work. But then also don't be tokenized and say, we got one non-Christian person so we're good, right? Uh, and asking that one person to do all the educating, right? And so who is your, who your people are will tell you a lot. So um, in the early 2000s, I used to actually called a bracelet uh, that you would go through like 15 questions, you would get a different color bead, or you would kind of go through questions like, who's your best friend, who's your doctor, who's your neighbor, who's your childhood best friend, who's your favorite teacher in high school, whatever, whatever. And then you'd go through and identify their race as you, as you perceive them. Then you go through and get a, a different color bead. You have to look at it. It's like, how diverse is my community and my, my relationship? And it's just always fascinating to see that most of the white people had mostly white with like one black, right? Yeah. That one black friend. Uh, or, you know, and black folks would have like one, you know, mostly black with like two white people, right? And and here I am being like, I've never been in a place where that's been able to be possible I can just have a brown beans. Right. Because I have to have white and black beans. Like, to exist, because that's just my reality. And, but, it's also made me a person, like, to then recognize where and how I often fit or do not fit in spaces. So I'm able to navigate those spaces much easier because I've, that's, that is my life. That is the reality of it. And so if you're not able to do that question of who is your community for your core work and not just the external, you know, you can do the pretty looking one, right? That's going to church, right? That's going to the, the gala, that's going to whatever, whatever. But if it's not doing core work of having the, the difficult conversations like Dwight, what the fuck was that? Right, right. Can we have a conversation like, what is that? Like, why? How did you not think that having a cross at the interfaith ceremony is not going to be okay? Right? If we don't have that core work community, then we're not getting anywhere because still it is this superficial healing that allows us to feel good about ourselves without actually doing good for ourselves. Uh, and then the liberation journey is like always recognize we are we have lots of shit to do and not enough time, but that we don't have to get exhausted because. because where we are is where we are, and what we're doing is what we can do, but we can always, every day that we have is an opportunity for us to say, what am I going to do the same today that helps me in my own Sudhi and healing? What am I going to do differently today that aligns me with my Sudhi and healing? 
And that those are, I think those are two important spaces that allow us to live in that space. More questions that I often ask and think about when I think about the work around decolonizing, whose perspective is not at the table? Instead of token, right, rather than saying, who is not at the table? So like, we don't have a white person, please come and be the white person, right? That's increasing diversity, but it's not actually increasing the actual conversation. Because like, I'm just like, you do all the teaching, healing, navigating, and then like, I just feel good because I've done that because you're at the table, but you're not actually, you're having to do a lot of the emotional, physical, spiritual energy to hold that space, right? But if I can say, what perspective am I taking? I can say, well, how might this policy impact someone that is Muslim, right? How can this maybe housing policy or this question that we ask around gender that only has male and female impact someone that might not fit in those categories? You don't have to be a trans person or a gender person to ask that question. Because often if you don't have, if you're not that person, you should have more agency to ask it and not have it be negatively reflected on you. So it's using the privilege of like, who's perspective not, and how do I develop my perspective? That is not say I'm gonna understand what it's like to be a black woman in this world. But to say, how might this negatively or positively impact black women though we're serving? Right? That's a very different question than saying we just have to get a black woman at the table. We just have to get a uh, you know, Muslim, queer, trans person at the table. Because there's never enough people at the table and never space at the table to get all the voices to make sure that we're doing the work right. right? Uh, and then what is my, I mean, are you actually clear on your own framework of healing? Have you ever done the work of this is what I've been taught versus what I believe versus this is how I work and navigate the world? And those have to be in alignment often, but if they're not, then that often causes trauma. And then the piece of like, why is this important to my home? Like, how is my understanding of Hinduism, of going to a mosque, of going to a synagogue, going to impact my own liberation that's going to challenge me, not just in the ways that, you know, I often find that it's easy for me to talk about things where I'm oppressed or have a marginalized identity because it's, the pain is really close to me, so I can talk about it. It's much harder for me to talk about where I don't have that pain because I don't have to. I, I, I'm in a world where I haven't had to do that. And so the how is that leaning into that privilege piece, the, the access to our liberation process? And then just the world that we live in is like anti-blackness is reality, right? It is in the water, it is in the food, it is in the earth at this point. So how do we recognize how we are contributing to, thank you, um, and engaging with while also deconstructing? Like is we we collude with it all the time and we can be reengaged. And then just how do I foster a community that's guided by the core of liberation? Uh, that if you're familiar with uh, Bobby Harrow's work, who was at UMass Amherst, she does the cycle of liberation, the cycle of socialization. If you're not if you're not familiar with the work, check it out. It's an incredible kind of work. Uh, but like how do we really focus on the core of liberation as a source of healing for all of us that allows us to decentralize question? Thank you. Thank you. Ah, any questions, thoughts, ideas? <laughs> I like that you pointed out that anti-blackness because as a black man traveling the world, I could not get a taxi in of New course. York. I couldn't get a taxi in Minneapolis. I couldn't get a taxi in Hong Kong. You know, it's it's and, and I'm profiled the, the entire globe. While my compatriots go straight through security. Every time I get pulled to the bank, it's like a joke. Right. You know, they like, we know you well, going I know airports and I know each other really well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or if I'm driving in neighborhoods, I, uh, the cops always stop me right. and ask me, why? because I'm in the white Ford source. Right. Hey, IT guy, where are you going? Right. Why are you in this area? So I like that you shared that. And that the fact that it's it not is. just an American experience, right? If you're in the middle exactly. of India, in I'm the middle saying. of Hong Kong, you will, because the whiteness is still so yes. embedded yes. In col and that colonization is so embedded yes. that these oppressions are also embedded. Right. And so that it's healing, a global thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so that, that healing has to be at a global level. We have to think. So that's the other piece, like, how do we decentralize Americanness and right. US centricness in healing? Yes. So that's not the, I don't think that's where the work is. Right, right. But we have to have, and again, language, right? We're talking in English today. Uh -huh. Which is a very Christian Western language that has been used to oppress me and my people and all of us, and yet that's the only language that we can use to communicate. Yeah. <laughs> and so, how is how do we decolonize that? We had to, uh, one of our crisis prevention wanted to have a uh, single de Mayo day. Uh -huh. He wasn't aware of how offensive that was to the Latinos in our in our. Care so that was a moment of education 
uh, within our team that, hey guys, you know, this is really a, a, a Euro-centric thing that our, our patients don't even, you know, care for that type of event. So uh, being aware of who you're trying to heal right. is an, a key imperative that I saw as well. And what is it for? And I just wanted to Right, right, right. Our own, uh -huh. our own, and I do believe in healing. As, as a continual process, with this notion of healing, uh, being, like not that I heal, but like I am healing always. I'm yeah. always believing in my own healing, and that that is my work. Mm -hmm. So that when I am well, that I can reflect like that, and that other people will come along on their own journeys and yeah. walk alongside. So I just, um, I wish that we could not walk alone anymore. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm wondering. Because we're trying to be center Christianity. What from your rituals and healing practices do you share with us? Yeah, and then that that maybe we can bring into our questions or reverence. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, do you want to repeat the question? To decenter Christian healing practices, I'm wondering if Roger could share with us, especially having such knowledge of Christianity, some rituals or traditions within your path that would be important for us to have in our repertoire so that we can be more articulate right. or ask more intentional questions. Yeah, and so I think, you know, I, I often start and end prayers with Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And so Shanti simply means let there be peace. And we say it three times, and there's multiple interviews. One is mind, body, spirit. So may my body, mind, and spirit be at peace with each other and in the world. The other interview is may I be at peace with myself, may my community be at peace, may my the universe be and so there's no spirit, there's no God, there's no religion, there's no idolatry. It seems saying, let there be peace, right? And so I think that's something that, and even Om, is the the sound of the universe. It was the sound that came from the, the creation of the universe. So, and when you say Om, you actually open your mouth and you close it. So it represents everything that has a beginning, middle, and an end. And so everything in the universe, including divinity, has a beginning, middle, and an end. And so it represents the entirety of the universe in this one sound. And in doing that, that vibration actually allows us to connect to this divinity within ourselves. Uh, that is not a specific religious body, but simply a spiritual energy body. It's a sound. It's not a religion. It's a sound, right? So when you think about like Christian, like Black Church, and all the sounds that come through that are so not really work, but they're, but they're energies, right? They're manifestations. And so are there ways for us to manifest? I think for me, that's something that's really helpful. And the other piece that I often do, every time I wake up and every time I go to bed, I say, Samasta loka May the whole world be at peace. May the whole world be content. You know, sukha is content. Uh, and so may the whole world be content, whatever that looks like. It's not about, may my people be content, may those, right, it's, it, but it's, may the whole world find whatever it needs to heal and soothe in the way that it needs to be content. Uh, so that we're able to, it's not even happiness, right? Because happiness is such a fleeting experience, but content right. is a living state of being. Yeah. That is like, all, and for me, like that contentment is, may you have all your needs and may you have all your resources, may you not feel oppression, may you not feel harm. And all that in this work is just sukha, right? It's like, yeah. it's, may the whole world be at peace. And what does it mean if all of us were to just start and end our days with that? How do we just change and transform our work and our world? You were saying, sorry, I missed your point earlier. No, earlier. that's a lot, but thank you again for this time. Um, I was just talking about our notion. Of, I know growing up, our notions of being with other people, but what if we just kind of in line with what you just mentioned, what you just shared, if my day started and ended with, I want to be with right. and that, that I am solely focused on my well being, how that can transform. Spaces where I work, you know, where I live. Well, they I say hurt people, hurt people. Right, heal people, heal people. Yeah. So, like, but, 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 but the nature is that not that I wake up trying to heal other people, but right. yes. I wake up trying to be well, that I am right. more focused on that. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
you know, I am kinder to people in nature. I, I give more by nature. You know, I am more patient by nature. Yeah. So that's it. Just like this kind of getting away from me. I'm going out to feel the place that I want to be well. And then that well is I'm a guy who went to the black gay for this month. I just wrote a book called Love and Rage. And they were talking about Love and Rage earlier. Because, like, yeah, there's a book that's, like, amazing. Uh, and he yeah, talked, I didn't see sex on your slides either. <laughs> right. Well, because we got that right. Right. Exactly. So we're, not, so we're talking about decolonizing sex with like healing, okay? Uh, <laughs> but I agree with you. But I agree with you. Uh, but, you know, so he talks about authenticity, uh, you know, is the state of being where you are not causing harm to yourself or those around you. Right. And I was like, that, like, if we can create a sense of healing, for, if everyone in the world was able to exist in a way that is not causing harm to itself, yeah. and then I would, and the piece that I would add uh-huh. to your point uh-huh. is that my, the other thing that I've learned in the last couple of years, like, I have had to do a radical surrender yeah. to pleasure, yeah. to my pleasure, mm-hmm. and then adding on to, in ways that do not harm myself or those around me, yeah. right? Yeah. So if we can, if everyone in the world, in the universe, could live in a radical yeah. surrender yeah. to their own yeah. desire and pleasure, yeah. that does not harm themselves yeah. or other people, Imagine what the fuck that world would be. Oh, it's just so transformative. Like, right. yeah. like if everything that I preach about this joy, this pleasure, this peace that I experience, it doesn't harm me. I'm not a little bit of a strapper. I'm not a little bit of a strapper. I'm not a little bit of a strapper.